Okay, I think we are going to get started. Um, hopefully, a few more will will wander in, but we're getting a a good critical mass. <laughs> uh, no pun intended. So, uh, welcome to the next in our lecture series from New South Meets Global South. Um, today, and this is I have really small print, so I'm going to have to squint. Uh, today, our speaker is Renell A. A. Noel, PhD, from, or who is, sorry, the Lucian and Rita Cast Assistant Professor in Architecture and Urban Design at the Carnegie Mellon University School of Architecture, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, she is a computational design scholar, artist, and director of the Situated Comp Computation Plus Design Lab. She investigates traditional and digital practices and their intersections with society. Using interdisciplinary approaches, she builds new frameworks, methodologies, and tools to explore social, cultural, and polit political aspects of computation and emerging technologies for new reconfigurations of practice, pedagogy, and publics. Her work has been supported by the Graham Foundation, the Mozilla Foundation, and Ideas to Innovation, among others. She is a recipient of the Design Futures Young Award for Exceptional Research and Scholarship in the field of critical comp computational design. And she has a great TEDx talk titled the Power of Making, Craft, Computation, and Carnival. I've seen it, I recommend it. <laughs> um, Dr. Noel holds a PhD from the Pennsylvania State University, a Master of Science in Architecture Studies from MIT, a Bachelor of Architecture from Howard University, and a Diploma in Civil Engineering from Trinidad and Tobago. Noel has held positions at Georgia Institute of Technology, the University of Stuttgart, the University of Florida, Penn State University, MIT, the single Singapore University of Technology and Design, and has practiced as an architect in the US, India, and Trinidad and Tobago. Noel is also currently a board member of the Association for Community Aided Design and Architecture, also known as Acadia. So let's welcome for now, Dr. Noel. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be be. I... No, I'm I'm good. Um, just want to say that you see my full body um, before I move behind this podium. Okay. Uh, so. Good afternoon to all of you all. Thank you very much for having me uh, at your lecture series, New South Meets Global South. Uh, I thank faculty, staff, students, and everyone who helped put this together. I know a lot of labor happens, so I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, so I've titled my talk, Investigations into Craft, Culture, and Computational <laughs> Practice. Um, Okay, just getting slight things happening here. Um, so as Nadia mentioned, I'm a computational design scholar, artist, and architect, uh, currently at the Carnegie um, Mellon University. So what do I do? Uh, I examine craft and cultural practices, technological practices, and their intersections with society. I examine how computing can benefit craft practices and vice versa, how craft practices can inform how we frame and engage in computing. I ask, how might we repair craft, technology, and society? I examine knowledges and practices, tools and technologies, communities around these practices and our, out and our outcomes or their outcomes. What do I mean when I say repair? When I say repair, I use Richard Sennett's description of repair, comprising restoration, remediation, and reconfiguration as points of departure. Restoration as a recovery in which the damage and use of history is undone with the restorer as a servant of the past. 
Remediation as preserving an existing form while substituting old parts for new and improved ones and reconfiguration as a radical kind of repair, one that is more experimental, exploring the connections between small repairs that we might make and their larger uh, social implications or consequences. These terms or categories are not fixed uh, and are oftentimes blurred. So there are several kinds of repair. Repair can be technical, social, pedagogical, conceptual, material, technological. Uh, all of these things, though, are entangled with the social. The social also includes the cultural, the political, the historical, corporeal, and many more. Then there are the multiple matrices that can come together by combining all of these. So why is repair necessary? To undo the damages of the past and today, and to prevent them from occurring in the future, to improve current and future processes, technologies, theories, etc., and to consider the small repairs we might make and their larger social implications. Some problems include the disappearance or erasure of certain knowledges, histories, and communities, their omission from discourses in computing and computation, and the changing practices due to global, societal, and technological shifts which usually impact societies least privileged. So two questions that motivate me in this work are, how might ideas, methods, and technologies in computing repair craft and cultural design practices? And how might craft and cultural practices repair ideas and theoretical frameworks in computing? How do I go about doing this work? These are some of the methods I employ, which range from ethnographic work to computational, artistic, and architectural modes of inquiry, developing new frameworks, tools, and methodologies, uh, building installations and pavilions, conducting experiments and workshops, and public engagement. One framework I've developed for carrying out this work, I call situated computations or situated computations approach. Uh, this work is published here in this paper, but situated computations is an approach to computational design, research, practice, or pedagogy that grounds our tools, our methods, and our theories in the social world by acknowledging the historical, cultural, and material contexts of design and making. It responds to a setting's social and technological infrastructure, and it asks that we refuse to remain ignorant of the social and political structures that shape our work. Some things that this approach does are, it creates a space for participation by those missing in research, practice, pedagogy, and discourse. Missing might include questions of gender, indigeneity, race, and other underserved or disenfranchised populations. Two, it resists the segregation and privileging of certain types of knowledges and skills. And three, it amplifies the, the stories of historically excluded and marginalized groups. Uh, currently, there are eight principles uh, in this framework, which serves as a guide for how we develop our interventions or tools, methods, theories, etc., such that we reveal histories, human dimensions, and recognize the partiality of knowledge within specific contexts. I will share with you how I think about these frames of repair and situated computations uh, in approaches to my work. The case study I will use is that of the Trinidad and Tobago Carnival and its embedded craft of wire bending. So the Trinidad Carnival is tied to slavery, like many things. Uh, the first record of enslavement in Trinidad was in 1606. French planters introduced carnival to Trinidad in the 1780s. And while Africans engaged in carnival festivities during enslavement, after slavery was abolished in 1834, the formerly enslaved reinvented, or one might say repaired, carnival to celebrate their freedom, express their creativity, their aesthetic sensibilities, and to reclaim their humanity in the face of a system or systems 
that considered them less than human. While the French and other Europeans participated in carnival for fun and frolic, for those of African descent, carnival was like a religion, cathartic, and a psychological release of tensions and the stresses of oppression, domination, segregation, and the violent, inhumane systems of control. On the right is an engraving from 1888 of carnival celebrations in Port of Spain, Trinidad. Several carnivals have spawned from the Trinidad Carnival to other parts of the world. Uh, I will always, uh, also see that there is a carnival in Charlotte. Um, the term Trinidad Carnival or Trinidad and Tobago Carnival does not bound the geographic location of the carnival as is evidenced by uh, the other places that, in which it occurs, um, but rather the main elements that define the carnival. This includes mass or masquerade, uh, the steel pan or steel drum, which was also invented in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1930s, and music native to Trinidad and Tobago, calypso or soca music. The carnival is rooted in expressions of joy, creativity, and innovation. These are photos of masqueraders wearing costumes and performing them during carnival. The history of carnival is also rooted in celebrating resistance and emancipation from enslavement, from the dangerous, cruel, forced labor and its many materializations. These are images of Jab Jabs and Blue Devil characters in Juve in carnival, and they originate from the celebration of resistance from enslavement and forced labor. I want you to remember these images or these characters. Carnival is also rooted in community with social interaction and togetherness, mentoring and cooperation and community engagement where people come together to design and make costumes and sculptures for the carnival, teaching and learning, organizing and participating in events in their communities. It's also about public education. This is a photo of George Bailey's winning carnival band from 1957. I think of carnival as the internet of that time, public education in art, history, storytelling, society, all of it wrapped up in carnival. People portrayed and educated publics on their histories, real and imagined, past and future. They showcased their creativity innovation and beauty using everyday materials. Carnival is about seemingly disparate things dwelling together, enslavement and freedom, good and evil, scary and beautiful. It's a space of entanglements. When these histories, values and expressions of resistance, creativity and community are forgotten or disregarded, things like this happen. In 2016, a mass designer released his designs for the carnival. There was public outcry about one particular section shown here. He was accused of trivializing the trauma of slavery, seeming to paint a different narrative on history that was seen by some as glamorizing a part of colonial history where racism and socioeconomic disparity were rampant and continues today. On the right is a mem meme someone created highlighting their feelings about his production that seemingly valorizes a slave narrative and a nostalgia for an era that abused, oppressed, and disenfranchised African people. This is just an example and a foreshadowing of what happens when a people's history is erased, banned, disregarded, discarded, or misrepresented. Uh, so some of the values embedded in Carnival include creativity and joy, celebration and resistance against oppression, social interaction and togetherness, mentoring and cooperation, community engagement, and public education. So that was an introduction to Carnival and its roots. I'll now share with you about the craft of wirebending. So wirebending is a craft practice integral to the design and fabrication of costumes and dancing sculptures in the carnival. This craft began in the 1930s and in it wire and other linear materials are sculpted to create large structures as seen here that are decorated for performance and competition. 
These artifacts are expressions of creativity, technical skill, innovation, and commentary on social, political, and environmental issues that occur locally, regionally, and globally. Uh, in the 1930s, wire bending was described by scholars as one of the most highly developed carnival crafts. My interrogation into design in carnival began because I was observing a changing aesthetic in the carnival and had hunches for why this was occurring. Scholars gave social, cultural, and economic perspectives on these aesthetic changes, but my hypothesis was that there were problems in design. During this work, I learned about the craft of wire bending that was at risk of disappearing. Its potential disappearance signals a loss of all that I showed you before. Culture, history, heritage, community engagement, mentoring and cooperation all tied to a people's creativity, innovation, identity, and emancipation. On the left is a photo from 1969 of a group of wirebenders. Historically, it is a male-dominated practice. On the right, expert wirebender Stephen Derrick performing wirebending. Based on my research, some of the issues occurring in craft practices today, including wirebending, includes little to no documentation of these craft knowledges, a slow transmission of craft skills and knowledge, dying experts and changing practices due to the shifts that might be global, societal or technological. But why should we care? Why should we care about these issues? Well, craft is embedded in historical, social and political frames. Their disappearance signals the erasure of histories, cultures, identities, and more. Secondly, because this knowledge is tied to its practitioners, it means that when they pass away, they take this knowledge with them, making it more challenging to pass on this culture and this knowledge. Thirdly, studies have shown that the quality of one's craft skills is closely related to the strength of their ties in a community. So strong craft skills, strong ties to a community, weak craft skills, weak ties to a community. And in this particular case, we want strong community ties. And fourth, these practices are a language, ways of communicating and telling stories, ways of world making. So we would not want a people's language to disappear. Some of the consequences of these practices disappearing include a loss and trivializing of people's histories and cultures due to a lack of education or miseducation, as I've shown before, a disappearance of knowledge, the fragmenting of communities and social relations, and creating technological inventions or interventions and discourses that are devoid of an understanding of these contexts. So, how might ideas, methods, and technologies in computing repair craft and cultural practices? To tackle the potential disappearance of this knowledge, the goal was to describe it. How might computing repair documentation of knowledge in wirebending? I documented, I started by documenting the tools and materials that were being used, conducted interviews, observations, etc. On the left is Stephen Derrick, and on the right, my beginnings of a computational description of the craft using symbols, operations, and rules based on artifact analyses, observations, interviews with wirebenders, and participating in the craft to make this tacit embodied knowledge explicit. I developed the Bailey Derrick Grammar, which I named after expert wirebenders Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick. And the grammar computationally describes technical knowledge in wire bending with a series of drawings representing the materials, steps, and techniques that allow for analysis, synthesis, and transmission of expertise for research, pedagogy, and practice. The grammar externalizes and formalizes tacit rules embedded in wire bending, which is particularly important when craftspersons are dying or retiring from practice. It sheds light on the craft's computational dimensions, opens it up for inquiry and expansion. The drawings shown here are but just a snapshot of all the rules and steps currently making up the grammar. 
This is an example of how the grammar can facilitate documentation of the fabrication process. And here is Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick, who I named the grammar after because I studied them, their work, and learned the craft from them to develop this grammar. This work is published here. So I now have this grammar. Does it work? My hypothesis was that it could repair the transmission of knowledge in wire bending. To test this, I conducted experiments with high school students and teachers in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, in the first part of the experiment, I wanted to get a sense of what participants knew or didn't know. Um, so they were tasked with designing and building artifacts using wire bending tools, techniques, and materials. They then had to describe to another team how they built their artifacts so that it could be replicated. They could not see what the other teams made. Um, so just with notes or drawing, they had to communicate what they did. Um, in the second part of the experiment, I taught them the grammar, that being the technical knowledge behind the craft, how to use it, how to use it to ask questions and explore, speculate. I taught them about the materials and connections, why and how they are used, demonstrated practical skills, so theory, then practice. After learning the grammar and how to physically engage with the tools and materials, I did the experiment again. So they had to design and make an artifact and then communicate how they made it without seeing what each other made. Before learning the grammar, there was poor craftsmanship, conflicting standards and instructions, a lack of knowledge, missing information, and participants expressed a lack of confidence in knowing what to do. After learning the grammar, there was now improved craftsmanship because there was an agreed standard for communication that facilitated replication, and they expressed an increased confidence in engaging in the craft. The grammar allows replication of artifacts, which can aid in the restoration of artifacts. Uh, in these photos, one artifact is the original, one artifact is the replicate, uh, and it's difficult to tell them apart. The most exciting part of using the grammar, however, was that it facilitated a new collaborative approach to the craft, one that currently does not exist and that appealed to participants. Currently, the practice is singular with one person to one or many artifacts. The Bailey Direct Grammar creates a collaborative approach to bending with additional ways of engaging through design, documentation, analysis, fabrication, assembly, and teaching, to name a few. This reinforces community with mentoring, cooperation, and social interaction that's embedded in design and carnival. Repatriation of these knowledges, we also take as an important part of the situated competitions approach, going back to those communities to get their feedback on what we've done, sharing what we've done with them, and finding ways to include them, include their voices and their cultures in computation. So how does computation repair the problem of dying craft knowledge or dying knowledge in wire bending? It aids in restoration by recovering craft knowledge and history and reinforces social interaction, togetherness, mentoring, and cooperation. It aids in remediation by preserving craft, but also substituting old ways of engaging with new ways of analyzing, designing, documenting, making, and teaching. And it reconfigures the craft by facilitating a collaborative approach to the craft that does not exist. This work is published here. So we now have the grammar. How might computing technologies repair and extend wire bending? To answer this, I created digital methods for engaging in the craft to address a lack of participation in the craft by those interested in computational technologies, the absence of women, children, and those with physical limitations as wire bending requires a dexterity and strength that may be out of reach for some, and to again further open up the craft for inquiry. I evaluated these three approaches with 11 participants in the US. 10 of the 11 expressed uh, or self-reported little to no experience in wire bending. One reported moderate experience. There were three men, eight women, so majority women participants, unlike the practice of wire bending, which is historically male dominated. 
The first approach I call computational crafting, and it employs the Bailey Direct Grammar and hand tools. Um, these are photos of some of the artifacts made from this method. The second approach I call crafting fabrication, which substitutes labor intensive bending by hand with computer controlled bending. By employing this method, we might open access to and participation in the craft by those with physical limitations, the techno conscious, women and children. And here are a few photos of artifacts made from this method. Uh, this third approach, uh, which I call digital crafting, employs digital design and fabrication using speculative software that I developed. This is an example of some of the output from that speculative software uh, and 3D printing. These are photos of artifacts from that method. So in this work, participants could learn craft through computation and practice computation through craft bringing those interested in craft and computation together, bringing multiple intelligences, visual reasoning, calculating, and sensory material experiences together in design. The work forecasts a new community of computational wirebenders. This work has been published here and here. So my students and I built two pavilions to further explore what wirebending might be able to tell us about architecture. Uh, at the scale of architecture and or erection of it. I show, I think in this presentation, just one of them. But here is an image of one of the pavilions that we built uh, using wire bending techniques and principles. Here are images of new tectonics that we designed, developed and tested for application at the architectural scale to build that pavilion. These drawing on the computational description of the craft in the form of the Bailey Direct Grammar. So after investigating these craft practices at their original scales, I explore them at architectural scales to consider new tectonics, social relations, expressions, and conceptual framings for design computation. Um, these are pavilions that I've made. The sail on the left explored digital design and fabrication methods and form generation based on characters in Carnival. Uh, the second one, like I just mentioned, from dawn to dusk, explored these new tectonics at the architectural scale and the concept of computational regionalism. And the infinite line, which explored active bending structures grounded in localized practices of making. These works are published here, here, and here. So looking at wire bending through these multiple lenses facilitated a more nuanced definition of the craft. Wire bending is not just a specialized art combining elements of engineering, architecture, and sculpture, but its definition has now undergone a conceptual repair. It is, as per my definition, a milieu of interactions between material, community, senses, and the moving body while designing and making with static and dynamic linear materials for concurrent expressions of each in three-dimensional space. So how does computation repair and extend engagement in wire bending by restoring cultures of making in carnival? It remediates by preserving the craft while substituting traditional techniques with new software-based ones and generating new tectonics. And it reconfigures the craft by fostering new communities of wire benders and computational designers for practice and pedagogy. So now I'll touch on uh, some broader about heritage, though what you've seen before is includes heritage. So how might computing repair heritage in the carnival? In the 1950s, the University of the West Indies undertook the first study of the Trinidad Carnival, 116 years after the carnival's creation. Published in 1956, researchers attempted to trace some of the major traditions and origins of the carnival. Using text, photos, and sketches, they sought to document some of the traditional characters in the carnival. Here are some pages from those articles. In 1985, 29 years later and 39 years ago, scholar Errol Hill 
called for the preservation and development of traditional characters in the carnival. He suggested that they be preserved in four ways, literature, photographs, dolls, and a carnival museum for blown up color portraits, films, videos, and costume exhibits, all available to the public. 39 years later, we still do not have a museum centered on carnival in Trinidad and Tobago. To address this problem of heritage, I sought to define dancing sculptures, these dancing sculptures in carnival. They are large, temporary, they are dynamic and worn, performed by the body. Here are four examples of the characters of, and costumes traced in that research. There are many, I'm only showing four. The Mokojumbi traced to 1895, the Bat to 1899, the Imp in 1912, and Children of the Moon, which is a more recent one from 1984, but I, I like its geometry. So I describe these characters through four attributes and call them stick artifacts. Stick artifacts are spatial, so they are large three-dimensional sculptures that require a lot of space for storage, performance, and exhibition, and are best understood in three dimensions. They are temporal, created to last for a short period of time. They are corporeal, performed by the body, worn on the body, and not fully understood if displayed independent of the body, and they are kinetic, dynamic sculptures or structures. So these are stick artifacts. Literature in 1956 described these artifacts with drawings, photos, and text, as I mentioned previously. So you could see that here, sketches, photos, and text as to their sizes, what they were comprised of, how they moved. So I wanted to explore new ways of documenting stick artifacts to address problems of design and problems of heritage in this context. By interpreting text, photos, drawings, and video, I developed computational and parametric descriptions of these artifacts. So here is the Mukojambi, here is the bat, here is the imp, and here are children of the moon. So the top images are the stick artifacts and below digital or parametric descriptions of them. I also explored augmented reality with digital modeling software, Unity Game Engine, Vuforia, etc. Uh, this was around 20, what, 14 or 15 times fly, time flies, I think about 2014 or 15, one or the other. Um, and so this enabled digital engagement with artifacts as scaled dolls, and this could also work at the full scale, right? I also explored computer interaction with parametric software and the Kinect um, with fi Firefly to track the body's movement. So there's a parametric description, but then there are connections, digital connections to the body. Here is my friend uh, and colleague at that time interacting with a digital Mokojambi, right? So we could tell the fun that he's having. We had fun watching him for sure. Uh, here he is uh, with another friend of mine. And what was interesting about these interactions is one, it's interacting with a computer, but the situation facilitated them interacting with each other, right? Uh, here I am exploring uh, the bat. Here I am exploring the bat with our colleague. We are, we are both like very surprised at this point, which is why you see the giddy smiles on our faces. Uh, then we have the imp playing with the imp. Uh, and again, both of them exploring that together, right? So in addition to the existing forms of documentation, we now had new ways of documenting and interacting with these stick artifacts through scaled figures, parametric descriptions, augmented reality, and computer interaction. So how does computation repair design and heritage? It restores by recovering design histories in the Trinidad and Tobago Carnival. 
It remediates by preserving traditional characters, computational descriptions of characters, and creates new designs or new design possibilities and interactions. And it reconfigures by considering physical space required for museums, which is particularly important in the case of small island developing states or SIDS, uh, what, which is one of which Trinidad and Tobago in, is included. So islands that have limited land space, uh, building new digital communities around Carnival. This work is published here. So the following project builds on themes of heritage documenting documentation and interaction from the project that I just showed you. Uh, around four years after doing that project, I got the opportunity to explore it further with artificial intelligence uh, and design. In 2020, the Mozilla Foundation had a grant call to fund ideas for projects that would examine the effects of artificial intelligence on racial justice. And we were one of the winners of this grant. My collaborators were digital artists, Natrice Gaskins and performer Valencia James. Our approach to the call was using AI to celebrate culture, histories and creativity in Carnival. Two questions framing the project were, how might we educate our publics about AI and machine learning through familiar cultural design practices? And how might we educate our publics about cultural and historical practices, in this case, the Trinidad Carnival, through AI and interactive means. The vision was a diaspora that engages with, learns about, and interrogates AI to benefit themselves and contribute to global discourses in AI because we are already implicated in decisions around big data. So the project includes three virtual events that draw on real events in Carnival dancing sculptures, in kings and queens competition, juve, and mass. Uh, here is an example of a dancing sculpture in Carnival. It, it remains one of my favorites from 2011, Pacific Tsunami by Wade Madrid. So we have, what might the result be if we trained a machine with a data set of dancing sculptures? These are some of the dancing sculptures imagined by that machine. So these design possibilities for dancing sculptures could reconnect people to their history and connect them to possible futures while also having an impact on design and making cultures. So it's not just about the thing, but what the thing facilitates, imagination of new and old futures. The second event was Juve, and Juve characters in Carnival, as I mentioned before, celebrate the emancipation of enslaved people and abolition of slavery in Trinidad and Tobago. Here is a video of Blue Devil characters in Juve and what they do in Carnival. These are AI-generated images of Blue Devils and Jap Japs. So remember in 1985, Errol Hill called for a Carnival museum with color portraits, film, et cetera, all available to the public. This work draws on that. Uh, this work is a virtual carnival museum with photos and AI generated images of artifacts and characters in carnival with films and videos of dancing sculptures, all available to the public. It includes an online virtual gallery to showcase these AI generated dancing sculptures. The virtual gallery includes audio describing and educating publics on AI and Carnival. It also encourages visitor participation. These digital online spaces, especially during the pandemic, were spaces where people could still engage together about and through Carnival. The virtual Juve experience showcases AI-generated Jab Jabs, Blue Devils, and Jab Molasses with audio describing the history and exhibit with videos and, and music to create the feel of Juve with its scary and beautiful parts. They could come together to listen music, watch images, and just experience a bit of Juve and again, connect with others. And Number three, the virtual mass builds on the masquerade. This is just a quick video to give you a sense of the scale and the events of mass. 
The virtual mass experience has different stages for celebration with music, photos, and videos relating to carnival. They do not contain AI-generated representations. This project developed during the 2020-21 COVID pandemic, which caused several carnivals around the world to be canceled. This virtual mass was created so that old and new audiences could engage in carnival with friends and strangers during a period when physical separation was necessary for our safety. So this project is more than the generation of design possibilities, but it includes how we showcase, celebrate, and extend cultural practices using digital tools and methods. How do we touch the ground and reach our publics? All right, so we now have three additional layers to explorations of technology and computation before with AI generated characters, virtual immersive exhibits and online interaction and learning. This work is published here. Some of these AI generated dancing sculptures were exhibited in 2022 at the Savvy Contemporary Gallery in Berlin, Germany. These are some images from that exhibition. So how does computation repair design and heritage? It does so in, through restoration by recovering again these design histories. It remediates by preserving traditional characters while creating new expressions, interactions, and digital communities. And it reconfigures by building new digital communities around carnival, AI, and education. In addition to the Mozilla Foundation, my work has also been funded by the Graham Foundation. Uh, in this exhibition, which ran from November of 2022 until last summer, June, uh, I answered the interdisciplinary question, what is a line, because I'm obsessed with lines, through the craft of wire bending and the Trinidad Carnival. I curated this exhibition, designed and made all the artifacts exhibited. Here is a photo of that exhibition uh, from outside. These are photos of some of the artifacts and uh, parts of the exhibition. A few more photos. So drawings, sculptures, etc., were exhibited. This is a photo from the opening. Uh, and I have a Matterport link where you can enter the exhibition virtually. So if you go here, um, eventually you will see a virtual entry for a 3D tour of the exhibition. So in conclusion, my work is around questions of repair, restoration, remediation, and reconfiguration. Acknowledging that there are different types of repair, different kinds of repair that may be technical, sociological, pedagogical, et cetera, and that all these things are embedded in the social and then the many matrices. Uh, all within the creation of several frameworks, one of which includes situated computations framework, which asks that we ground our tools or methods and theories in the social world by acknowledging their contexts, their historical, social, cultural, and more contexts, and responding to a settings infrastructure that might be social, cultural, technological. And it asks that we refuse to remain ignorant of social and political structures that shape our work. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time for questions, answers, discussion, um, and you all probably uh, remember how we do this. So I've got the mic, and uh, which we need for the recording and also so everybody can hear. So please uh, raise your hand and of course tell us your name, what program, what your level, etc. that you're in. Um, and uh, I'm sure Vernal will be happy to answer. Okay, right away, down in front. Let's see. I'm going to do this from the side. Um, hi, my name is Brianna. Um, I'm a first year undergrad student. 
Um, so I'm Montserratian American. My dad's from Montserrat. You're you're from Montserrat. My dad's from Montserrat, so okay. I'm Montserratian American. Okay. But um, so my family's like really big into like construction and architecture. So like, there's this huge idea that like the education that we get here, we're expected to like bring it back to Montserrat. So um, and that's like also something like my dad does. Like he does work there as well. So how do you find your way of contributing? Like, how did you come to the conclusion that this was the route to go through? Like, like this is the way to do it. Um, and when you say this is the way to do it, what do you mean? Um, how did you decide that wire bending was your way of contributing? Like, this is like it was like. How did you come to it being your like your calling? I guess. Uh, I don't know if it's my calling, but. I'll tell you how it started. Um, I knew I wanted to do my research on something that was uh, grounded in who I am and my history. Uh, and so in doing field work to find out what my thesis would be, because I, I was noticing, like I mentioned, these um, changes in the aesthetic of carnival. So it was going from real tectonics and construction of costuming to what we now call bikinis, beads and feathers, right? So it started with a question, always the question, uh, why is this happening? And my hunch was that there are problems in design and design there could be many different problems, right? Um, and in field work of trying to get a lay of the land is where I found, oh, this particular craft is disappearing, right? So what might that mean for particular expressions or revealing histories? There was no forethought of where this might be. It was just a question. And each question led to another question and led to another question. So all the multiple iterations of ways in which you, you see this project has become, they've just always start from questions. What if, how, why? Uh, and what I'm presenting is an argument for how we might uh, use computation, frame computation to engage with and open up our field to include, uh, rather than the abstract notions of computation that seem so universal to acknowledge that it's not universal and that people are left out when we make it seem so universal, that there are other ways of learning, right? There are ways of learning through making, through coding, um, but acknowledging these histories and the things that really impact our work are important. So my answer to your question is that it's just the question that I keep asking and what I'm presenting is an argument. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Hi. my name is Abby. I'm also a first year. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and how you're not shying away from it. Could you talk a little bit more on that and how you think it would be beneficial to um, continue that history and tradition? How would it be beneficial to... So my exploration of it there was really exploration to what if? Right? What might we learn from this? Um, and how the different conversations around AI, machine learning that could, that could seem to leave people out, leave communities out, while at the same time using their data, like engaging in that discourse was important. So um, how we might think about AI and machine learning of a space of creativity where people can explore, uh, think of new design possibilities for dancing sculptures, hopefully make them. That is an experiment I still have to do. But how we use that entangled space for others to learn different things. So how you, you explore AI to not just understand AI, how it's used. So we had uh, Zoom workshops. Again, this was during the pandemic. So we had workshops where people from the Caribbean and other places were invited so we could share with them what was done, get their feedback on it, and have discussions like, this is what AI is about. This is how we did this thing. Um, and the virtual spaces being one where those who are foreign to Carnival, right, anybody here, could also go into that virtual space and learn about Carnival. Um, so 
my answer to your question is, is just always a question, right? The what ifs and the hows and the whys. Um, and in this particular context, this is how I envision one way that we might use it. Yeah, in, in a way that's grounded and it's not just, oh, I'm designing these possibilities, but then what do we do with that, right? Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Leo. Um, I'm a first year too. And asking all the questions. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, you talked about uh, this like kind of relationship between craft and computation and ability, and I I just wanted to ask what how do you think craft relates to comp computation? Do you think computation really enables people to learn about like the craft methods through like dissecting like how the things are made or do you think it can in some ways like abstract us from the physical craft of the things around us those tectonics you were talking about yeah great question um so the what job of computation in some ways is that is abstracting things the job of all of us as architects and designers we abstract things so computation in this regard helps because it's not like I'm not saying use Rhino, right? It's drawings uh, that describes or makes explicit the knowledge that's in the minds and bodies of those practitioners who all have since passed away, right? Uh, when they were alive, I was able to take the grammar back to them, uh, and they would, be, you know, I would discuss it with them and. Mr. Bailey, for example, he's like, oh, yeah, I, I get this. I get this. Uh, and another wirebender, he's like, oh, I could definitely use this. This would help me and it will help me show others how to do things, right? So in this context, computation is set up as this particular context. They're familiar with drawing. They're familiar with these tactile visual ways of thinking about computation. How do we frame computation so that it's on, on, the, on their terms, right? For me to bring a computer and Rhino, it's useless. It's, it's far, in fact unfair to use something like that in a context that they're not using, right? Um, and to the flip side of how craft informs computation by examining the values that are embedded in this context, thinking through how we frame computation so that those values might be embedded. So things like doing ethnographic work so that I'm not doing something airy fairy out here, but it's grounded on a people's histories, a people's culture, because I could also make technological interventions that go nowhere because it does not relate. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, hey, my name is Daniel. I'm a freshman student. Um, my question is, well, first of all, I want to say that it's very impressive what you have done. Uh, I'm from Colombia. Uh, in Colombia, we also celebrate carnivals mm -hmm. and it's also very important in our traditions. Yeah. And at some point, I have feel that uh, like we have been stuck in some point that it's for especially for like the new gener generations, you have to like get the way or like the media to show them what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very interesting how you're using technology as a tool to like show the same thing, but in a different manner kind of way. So my question is how you like preserve the integrity and the initial, like the origins of the traditions, the heritage uh, without losing some parts of the things between the physical, what have been done for centuries and what is doing, what, and what you're doing now with like the computer and all these tools. Sure, sure, thank you, I love that question. So I uh, I use the word repair. I don't think of, you know, there's a lot of load and weight behind terms like preserve and preservation, right? So I think of it across time, across context, right? Acknowledging these different situations. Um, so I was thinking of something that when you asked the question, how do I preserve this? So for example, uh, in my teaching of this craft, 
For example, last weekend, I had a workshop that was amazing. I am sure to ground its context, right? So you're not just going to come do a workshop, you leave learning, learning some wire bending techniques without acknowledging the history, the people, the names associated with this. Um, and I think of it as through the lens of repair, it helps to think of it as opening it up to new audiences um, and always tying back these histories, even in, in the carnival AI exhibition, like you learn about the histories of, of these things, these practices. Um, I will tack on a question that often happens close enough to one that you asked where people ask me, so suppose someone from somewhere else takes this grammar and they go make a million dollars by just, you know, using the grammar and whatever. Uh, and my response to that is uh, the values of the community matters. So for example, within the context of the Trinidad Carnival, probably same in Colombia, the values of the place are what I showed, community engagement, mental learning, et cetera. It's not about getting rich, right? So if the, it's about what the grammar facilitates. So it, it facilitates those values. In another context, there may be another set of values, right? I think the onus is on that context to critique their values such that if, it, if, it, if it's different from the values of this set, then you should critique your, your values. That's my response, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Melina. I'm also a first year. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, about the Bailey and Derek grammar. You said how it was like taught to the children. And I wanted to see, like, I wanted to ask, how did the children absorb that grammar? As you said that one of the, I guess, problems of the craft in Trinidad, the tr slow transmission, like, did it take a long time? And what problems did you face in teaching that to the kids? Sure. Um, so... I didn't call it a grammar at all. I didn't even use that word. I said, these are some drawings that we're gonna explore. This was after they all engaged in making. So their, their context is familiar with the craft in some ways that it's, it may not be as foreign to audiences outside of Caribbean Carnival, but they're kind of familiar about what happens, but how the cookie gets made, they're not sure, right? But they, there is some contextual knowledge. Um, and so, the grammar that I gave them, it was, it's very simple. Like I mentioned, just a little bit that you saw on the slide, but showed them, went through drawing each of them for what things represent what, and then we all did engagements together. So teaching them how to wrap wire, how to bend, right? So it became, it's not an intellectual meaning, oh, this abstract thing, it's physical and material. So we all did it in each team. There, were, there was at least one teacher and students. So it's something very tactile. It's not, I'm not imagining what these things ought to be. I could draw it, I could make it. If it doesn't work, they ask me why something works. So some of the challenges, uh, it was an experiment. So I, I'm trying to remember what challenges there were. I think it was just fun for, for all. The biggest thing was these new multiple ways of engaging. So somebody could be like, you know what? I'm not making something. I'm gonna document how you all made it. Or they could analyze, okay, I'm, I'm recording this thing. What are we missing? So it was one of collaboration, one of fun, uh, opening up this thing from oh, one person making this thing to what are the different ways that I could engage in. Um, I can't think of any challenges right now. Doesn't mean there weren't any, but it was experimental. It was conducted in one day. So I had two workshops, two different workshops, each lasting a day, and we got a lot done. Um, so it was exploratory. I can't remember any challenges. Doesn't mean there weren't any. Uh, I just can't remember any right now. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cora. I'm also a first year student. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask if you could talk a bit more about the architectural like size scale of the projects that you did. And I guess I'm wondering if they are like if they're on display now in order to continue that sense of community that you've been talking about. 
Good question. None of them are up anymore um, due to my moving and due to things being temporary. Uh, one, yeah, just because of moving and those kind of things, but they could be rebuilt. Um, and there are pavilion scales, so about 12 feet by 12 feet, and they are to explore these things, right? So um, to explore ideas of how communities come together to make, to explore ideas of new tectonics, to explore ideas of structure, forces. Um, so they're not up physically anymore. Um, I would love to engage in these things back in Trinidad, meaning making some of these things, but the realities of research are around travel, money, and teaching. Um, and so I have not been able to do that as yet in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Ethan. I'm a third year undergrad. <laughs> um, and what you talked about, about like the, um, like the connections between craft and computation has just, um, um, for me, I'm personally just like brought up thoughts about the future and like where our profession is going um, and the presence of um, AI even in like the assignments that we've been doing and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was, I guess I was just interested in your thoughts about how we can like, um, uh, and also uh, from your perspective, from the work that you've brought up, how we could um, coexist with this rising um, and improving technology in in the fields um just like um in um, in like a general perspective and also how we can um how we can coexist with that and how we can also not lose sight of like the more um uh i guess uh what's the word um uh like what's the word like not not vulnerable but um uh I can't think it. It, it, it starts with a V. Um, <laughs> like the like from these styles of design and making from specific cultures, vernacular. Yeah, um, how we can kind of um, keep keep the, the spirits of that kind of design um, in in tune as we continue to um, to move forward in um, in t in technologies that they might not have been used to before. So I guess just. Your general thoughts. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so my response to that would be that it depends on us and yeah. our acknowledging that we have agency because to tools change, technologies come, and you know tomorrow there's going to be a new tool that they want us to use, right? Um, so part of it is, I think, understanding where we are on that train and practice is different from pedagogy, is different from research, right? Um, there's always going to be a tool that they want you to try. But I would say as architects, inherently, we are to think of our publics, our cultures, our histories, space, and the actual human. So a very techno uh, and techno-focused approach to architecture, like you only have so much time and resources, right? So either you're on the train to just understand every technology and practice through that lens, or you're gonna be like, hold up, what's happening in, in really here? Who is engaging with these things? How are we uh, validating or reconfiguring these histories, these vernaculars into architecture? Because the trick of uh, parametricism is this universalizing of everything, right? But there are different materials, different ways of making, different sites that have different resources. Uh, so my answer to that would be that it depends on all of you to remember that at the end of the day, we are to design for cultures, humans, different climates. And so how you use these technologies in ways that acknowledge those things rather than erase those things that's that's your responsibility. Don't let it don't let agency be taken away from you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cal. Back to the first years. Um, okay. I was wondering where you see your work now. 
uh, with the research you've done and implementing workshops with uh, wire working and all that, where where do you see it now and where do you hope to see it go? Uh, my desire and love for my work is to explore all of these possibilities to different crafts and craft cultures and craft histories. So while this is wire bending, the thought is that it, it goes to other craft practices. So I can engage in other studying other craft histories and craft practices and do these same explorations with them. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we got one back. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Joel Fudge. I'm an M1. Uh, I first want to say thank you uh, for this presentation. And my question is kind of twofold. My first part of this question is from your research work um, in the context of crafting, has there been a spike in interest and in work that the cultural residents of Trinidad have been able to pick up on and, and grow and explore that? And then to that question, has there been a self exploration in that culture to explore other means of crafting that has provided more sustainable um, and economic uh, opportunities for them to in the long run? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a spike in interest in work. So in, let me see, I started this work in, 2012 and just before that Stephen Derrick while he was alive uh, as well as some other wirebenders the government had some workshops where they had these experts teaching or attempting to teach wirebending right um, I don't think they have been actually no they, I think I see a few pop up every now and again I have I've not been able to be there to see what's happening and what they look like. Um, I do think there has been probably over the last five or six years, a spike in like people stepping back and saying, wait, this bikini and beads thing, we tired seeing this thing. And so there's been a return to some beautiful new ways of thinking of old costumes, so moko jumbies, and I mean, really, really, you can tell they're like, uh, 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 let's let's hold up on this thing. So I would say, yes, there's been, I've also seen experiments that people have done using mid-journey, a ways of experimenting with new visuals in carnival. So I would say there's a rich return to a public use of different technologies in imagining what carnival can be. Um, your second question of self-exploration and other means of crafting, I would say probably technologically by exploring these new tools. Uh, when it comes to the making side, I'm not sure as yet. Yeah, I'm not sure of any new, no way I could think of as yet or I've seen. Yeah? All right, you're welcome. I see one question in the back. Hi, my name is India Barjanir, and I'm a fourth year student, and I just wanted to take the time to thank you again for sharing your, us with your extensive research. And my question is, how did your experiences studying abroad in India and Singapore, as well as your understanding of cultural importance and cultural connection, shape the foundation of your research? And how did you foster those connections throughout your work to benefit your study? Damn, what a question. <laughs> uh, very, very good. Now I have to search my memory palace in ways that I didn't plan to. Um, what would I say? What would my experience? Uh, that's a hard question. I feel like we should, you know, have a coffee over that question. Maybe. Um, but I think my ability to have had the privilege of engaging in so many different ways of being and seeing um, and understanding my positionality. So as a black woman in India, as a black woman in India among expats, right? 
when am I an expat? When, when am I not? Uh, in Singapore, again, a black woman, I've, I am usually the only one in several spaces. Um, in Singapore, a richness to the culture that was very familiar in that it reminded me of my country. Um, and, and one thing that sticks out to me only because it was a recent discussion. So in Singapore, I had many students, I think classes were like 75, right, students. And all of my students, their names, it was my responsibility to know their names and pronounce their names correctly, right? Uh, and when I think about that difference in the US context where, what, what do you call it? Like foreign students change their names for uh, ease of pronunciation. For me, I'm like, wow. It, uh, I see it as an erasure that, uh, let's say I, I, I pay attention to that you don't need to erase who you are. It's my responsibility to pronounce your name properly and acknowledge your identity that you walk in the door with. Um, so I think just being in spaces of when am I this or that has given me the uh, thought of I'm always an observer. I'm always looking at how things happen um, and understanding myself in those spaces and others. I don't know if that's an answer, but that's what comes to mind right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Difficult. We've probably got time for one or two more. Ah, okay. Yay, yay. Jonathan. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Jonathan. Okay. I am Jonathan. I'm a first year. Are they getting graded for having questions? Uh, beautifully presented as always. Your work is really looking at assemblies. Mm -hmm. techniques, tactics, procedures uh, toward the making of something. But the thing that you're making is by nature temporary. Mm -hmm. So to what extent have you looked at this assembly and are there current cultural practices within the carnival that may suggest a means for recycling, reusing, um, you know, we're talking about disassembling buildings now on behalf of our environment. Mm -hmm. To what extent can we learn from the carnival in its practices of disassembly and reuse? Um, and have you looked at it? Are there any, is there anything to learn? Sure, I have learned. Um, so thank you for your question. And these things are temporary, like you say, and many of the materials that they reuse are from them breaking down these artifacts, right? Um, plus using everyday materials like paper, et cetera, textiles, et cetera. Um, but in terms of a uh, real deep lens of this assembly and what that means for use of materials in architecture, I have not done the work out, but maybe we could do that together. Yeah? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands. So this is probably a good place to end. So let's thank Noel again. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.